Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 110. I hope you're doing great. Thank you so much for taking time out to join me here today. Um, It has been a lot of fun around here at Genealogy Gems since we last talked. Let's see, recently I ran an article in the last Genealogy Gems newsletter. It was called Coincidence or Genealogical Serendipity. It was about a listener who wrote in about some strange coincidences of significant dates that just run repeatedly through his family tree. The article also got posted onto Facebook and onto my blog, and it was really interesting how many family historians posted comments about how they had experienced the same sort of thing in their family tree. You can check it out at the Genealogy Gems news blog at genealogygems.com and then click blog in the menu. And to make sure that you're getting the newsletter while you're there at the website, if you haven't already joined us, you can sign up for the free e-newsletter and that will get you all the, the future newsletters. And also, of course, if you want to join us over at Facebook, we do have the Genealogy Gems podcast Facebook page. Just go to Facebook do a search on Genealogy Gems Podcast, and it'll pop right up and just click the like button. Tell them that you like Genealogy Gems Podcast. We appreciate it. (laughs) I've also had to do some online housekeeping lately. You may have noticed that the episodes 1 through 20 are no longer on the podcast feed. Now that we're getting into the triple digit episodes, I needed to clean out some of the older episodes So I would recommend that you download all the older episodes that you're going to want to uh, keep and listen to, because I do need to do this from time to time just for storage reasons and just general tidiness of the iTunes feed for Genealogy Gems podcast. So make sure that you grab those older episodes while you have them there, and then you can download them to your computer or iPod. And of course, there's a lot of genealogy news out there. Got an item here from the U.S. National Archives. There are some bargains to be had at the National Archives eStore, which is opening an online bargain vault. This is the the bargain vault as part of the National Archives eStore. They have a press release here that says the National Archives eStore has opened its vaults and discovered a wealth of publications and products that are now available at up to 80% off the original prices. The newly opened Bargain Vault offers a wide array of products from microfilm catalogs to framed pictures to books and more. There are limited quantities of these reduced items, so now is a great time to visit the eStore.archives.gov to take advantage of these reduced prices. In addition to the Bargain Vault, the National Archives eStore offers an abundant and unique inventory of products inspired by the archival and historical holdings of the National Archives. More than 500 archival, genealogical, and history-related products are available for purchase, including professionally framed parchments, gifts made from actual government red tape, (laughs) multimedia products based on popular National Archives holdings and exhibitions, and more. So for more information on that, again, you can go to eStore.archives.gov and click the Bargain Vault link that you'll find there in the menu. And the National Archives over in the UK has some interesting stuff going on as well. They just announced that on June 9th of 2011, they'll be taking part in the hashtag Ask Archivist Day, along with other archives from around the world. So what does that mean? Well, if you are a Twitter user, then you know what the hashtag is. It's the pound sign. It's the number sign. So it's number sign Ask Archivists. And you can follow that on Twitter. Of course, you can join Twitter for free uh, just by giving them your email address and making up a username. Well, what they're doing is on June 9th, you can use your Twitter account to ask the National Archives in the UK about their collection online resources, and how to do research at their archives. They're going to be answering questions about archival practices and advice, conservation, digital preservation, and web archiving. So get your Twitter accounts ready. Again, the hashtag to keep up to date with all the activities is hashtag Ask Archivists. And you can follow the National Archives UK on Twitter at UK 
NAT Archives. Then on June 9th, you can tweet your questions and watch their answers in your Twitter feed. So that's kind of a neat uh, use of social media if I ever heard of one. So that's pretty great. And speaking of social media, I was on Facebook the other day. I noticed that Dan Bukatinsky, who is the executive producer of Who Do You Think You Are, along with Lisa Kudrow, just announced on his Facebook page that the research for season three of Who Do You Think You Are has begun. So that's really good news. But of course, it got me thinking, you know, they've only been doing about seven episodes in what they call a season, when a typically a season is about 24 episodes. So what do you think? Do you think we'll get to see a full season of 20 or more episodes? Let's hope if it uh, grows in popularity, it may be able to nab more of a solid standing in the NBC lineup. That would be great. And here on the podcast, we've talked quite a bit about online family trees, and I received a press release from a new company called Real Time Collaboration Inc., and they have launched a new online product called Ancestor Sync. The idea here is that the service helps you synchronize between your computer, desktop, family tree database programs and some of the popular online family tree websites. It says that Ancestor Sync allows you to seamlessly download, upload, or synchronize your family tree with your online pedigree to your personal computer and back again. Ancestor Sync is the first service on the market that allows you to easily move all of your family history work from a desktop genealogy program to an online pedigree without anyone or anything getting lost in the process. So I think I can hear what many of you are asking in your head. That same question, does it support syncing with Ancestry.com's family trees? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> Ancestor Sync currently has partnerships only with Family Search, with Genie, and with Our Familyology. I got in touch with Real Time Collaboration to ask that all important question Do they have plans to support Ancestry Trees? And they replied pretty succinctly uh, We would like to support all the online trees. Currently, we have contracts with Family Search, Genie Inc., and Our Familyology Inc. We will announce other trees as they become available. Thank you for asking about Ancestry. Your request has been noted. <laughs> so I'm sure they would love to have that partnership because that would be terrific for their business. I don't know if Ancestry is going to be up for that, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to sync back and forth, regardless of what the program is, the, the database that you're using on your computer, and the online service that you're using. I'm sure that would be a big hit if they could expand even further out to include ancestry. So I'll keep you abreast of that and let you know if I hear anything. And finally, there is some news out of Ancestry.com. Last October, they launched Ancestry Labs, where they could test drive some new ideas. And now out of the labs, they are announcing the introduction of one of those ideas. It's called Web Search. And they are bringing that into the main Ancestry.com search function. The idea here looks to be that they want to expand the search capability of Ancestry beyond the Ancestry collections and website and reach out farther into the internet to help you locate other records being published on other websites, many of which, of course, are free. Ancestry says that their new web search will search selected websites and I think that's important to keep in mind here. Um, Ancestry has selected sites, so this is not a comprehensive internet search like you might do with Google. I'm sure it is focused on genealogy, digital collection type sites. And it brings back matching results that it finds along with a link to the site to enable you to go straight to the original record. Ancestry says that they're going to include the results into your main search results when they're relevant. Um, it's also going to list each collection that Ancestry has within their card catalog, which will allow you to search those collections directly from within Ancestry.com. Now, I know that some folks hearing of this will wonder again about Ancestry sort of tapping into and possibly taking advantage of other websites' content, which I think has been a bit of an issue in the past. And so Ancestry, it looks like, has anticipated <laughs> this concern, and they published what they call some principles that they are going to follow. The first principle that they're going to follow in terms of web search is in regards to free access to web records. Users don't have to subscribe to Ancestry or even register 
for free with Ancestry.com to view the records that are brought up through web search. Secondly, they say that they will always strive to follow web standards for web crawl and permissions. So, for example, some websites have what's called a robot.txt file that tells the search engines, like Google, not to crawl their website and to index their information, or, or to only crawl certain areas of the website. So Ancestry is saying that they plan to respect that same um, protocol as well. Third, Ancestry says it's going to give proper attribution of web records to content publishers. And they say that they're going to link prominently to the original site within the search experience. And I think that's a big one. That was a big concern in the past. And, you know, it's a pretty big deal to an organization, oftentimes a nonprofit or a genealogy society who's gone to a ton of work digitizing records or transcribing them and publishing them for free only to have Ancestry put them out there in a search as if they were part of the Ancestry collection, which, you know, they're not. So that makes a lot of sense. And it will be great to see them kind of follow that as well, giving that proper attribution. Fourth, they have in place processes, they say, to remove content from the index if a website owner asks them to do so. So they're anticipating that, and they will publish how to contact their team to do that. It says here that website owners can also email them at websearch at ancestry.com to ask questions, or you can request to have your site indexed if you want that greater exposure. And finally, Ancestry.com users will be able to save key information to their trees, but it will list the website as the source, and it will have an easy way to link back to the original site. So if you want to learn more about Ancestry's web search, head on over to Ancestry.com slash web search. They say that they are starting out small. So you may not see web search results in your search results for your ancestors for some time. Um, But I'll have a link in the show notes that will show you an example of what the results are going to look like. It's a search for Louise Chrisman, who died in Indiana. And the example shows that the first result says web, colon, and then it will say Allen County, Indiana, deaths, 1870 to 1920. And you can just click the link that says go to website. And that's kind of how it's going to work. So I'll have that for you in the show notes. Again, for this episode, number 110. To get to the show notes, just go to genealogygems.com, click podcast in the menu, and then follow the links navigating your way to episode number 110. You know, there's a real race out there, I think, for genealogy record providers to be a kind of a one-stop shopping resource, if you will. And I imagine that Ancestry kind of needed to do this in order to keep new sites like Archives and Macavo at bay. <laughs> I would be interested to hear what you think about Ancestry's new web search as you get started using it and checking it out. And I'd love to know how you think it compares with some of those other websites that also incorporate digital records from other websites. I call them website aggregators. You know, they're pulling all that data together with a genealogy focus. So let me know. Uh, you can drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com or call the voicemail line 925-272-4021. And coming up next, we are going to hear from you and we will do that at the mailbox. As I mentioned in the last episode, I've been doing some free webinar presentations lately, and I've gotten a lot of great email about them. First up from Cheryl of Flagstaff, Arizona, she writes, just wanted to say thank you very much for the newspaper webinar this evening. I'm so used to listening to your tips and tricks and helpful advice via podcast that it seems strange to know that you are really there on the other end of the computer. (laughs) I picked up several hints that I hope to put into practice over the holiday weekend. Thank you again for sharing your expertise and passion for genealogy. I'm looking forward to attending your Roots Magic Google webinars. Well, Cheryl, I felt exactly the same way. Um, I thought it was really neat to know that we were all live and that all of you were really out there listening and sending in your questions. That was really neat. Um, I did the newspaper webinar that Cheryl wrote in about for the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree folks. But if you missed it, you might want to consider becoming a Genealogy Gems Premium member because there's a recording of that same presentation that I gave last year on newspaper research. It is a part of premium membership. 
So when you sign up, along with your monthly premium podcast episodes and videos, you have access to the full one hour presentation on newspaper research. Lois also wrote in about how much she got out of the newspaper webinar. She writes, Hi, Lisa, I just have to tell you about my find after the newspaper scoop webinar. I am doing the genealogy for both my family and my daughter-in-law's family as a gift to my little granddaughters. Family folklore on my daughter-in-law's paternal grandmother's side has it that the family patriarch had left his wife and family in Poland and came over to the U.S., and started a new family. I found him in a large Midwest city back in the 1860s and 1870s, before he moved down to a city in the South in the 1890s. He had a wife and a son. I also found another son and a stepson from his second wife's first marriage. Well, after the webinar, I went to the University of Pennsylvania site that I had recommended in the webinar, and she says, I decided to start my search with a Southern city because it was a much smaller town where my family had settled. And much to my surprise, I found the attached, and she sent me a copy of this newspaper article that she found. She says, this solves a 100-plus year mystery. In addition to being better than reality TV, it was too fabulous not to share. (laughs) Regards, Lois. And again, Lois sent me an amazing newspaper article that spells out the entire sordid story in detail about how the first wife came to town after all these years, the husband's been gone. She finds the husband and the whole business unfolds. This article is really a genealogist dream though I have very carefully not shared the names and the places that Lois mentioned from this article here on the show, because as Lois said, this may not be a happy dream for the daughter-in-law's family. So I'm not trying to expose anybody here, but Lois, this is such a fantastic genealogy gem, and I am so glad that the seminar helped you locate it. That is always fantastic to hear. So thank you so much for sharing your experience. And along with the uh, getting the scoop on your ancestors in old newspapers webinar, In April 2011, I also did a free webinar for my friends over at Roots Magic. And we had a terrific turnout. About, oh gosh, over a thousand people were registered. And I've already heard from so many of you who have started to use some of the techniques, these Google search techniques that I showed you in the presentation. Uh, And if you missed it, no worries, because you can view this webinar. It's absolutely free. You can view it anytime at the Roots Magic website. Just go to rootsmagic.com. Click the learning tab and then select webinars and scroll down to the bottom of the page and you'll find Google, what do we call it? Ultimate Google search or tips and tricks, (laughs) something like that. Google search tips and tricks is what we called it. And of course, it's all pulling from information from my new book, which is the genealogist Google toolbox. And by the way, you'll notice at the end of that webinar that we ran a special on that book, uh, again, the Genealogist Google Toolbox, which the webinar was completely based on, and we were giving 15% off the book for the day of the webinar. Well, since not everybody was able to attend the live webinar, I've talked with Bruce over at Roots Magic and let him know that we're going to run a special sale in the Genealogy Gems store at Lulu from today through May 20th of 2011, just a couple of days. But we are once again offering the 15% off the brand new book. So take a look at the webinar. If you love it, you're going to just eat up this book. (laughs) I think you'll really find that it helps. And I'm going to actually tell you in just a few minutes another example of how the book has paid off for me recently. But in fact, I want to let you know, I went ahead and I just marked everything off in the store 15% off. I was in there anyway, so I just put the coupon code in there. Uh, There is one webinar that isn't 15% off. It's a recording. I marked it 50% off. That's a 5-0. So uh, what is that one on? Oh, it's Finding Living Relatives. Boy, am I having just (laughs) my senior moments. I'm having such a hard time remembering. I've been doing so much the last couple days, but... I was very excited to to make this available because I knew this episode would be going out. Lots of you would be checking out the, the now recording of the Google search webinar. So I want you to be able to get the discount on the book as well. So again, it's at the Genealogy Gems store at lulu.com. You can just go to Genealogy Gems and click store 
in the menu and then click the Lulu store link, or you can go directly to lulu.com and just do a search on genealogy gems. And, and I will have a link that takes you directly into the full genealogy gems podcast store at Lulu in the show notes. It's kind of a long <laughs> address, so it's kind of cumbersome to give you over the show. Let's see, what does it say here? stores.lulu.com slash store.php question. Yeah, you get the idea. (laughs) It's too long. So I will have a link directly to the store in the show notes. And I've got another free webinar coming up here very shortly with Roots Magic on Tuesday, May 24th, 2011. Mark your calendar. 5 p.m. Pacific, which of course is 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. That's the live broadcast of Google Earth for Genealogy. This is an introduction to Google Earth for Genealogy. It's going to be a fun 90-minute webinar. Uh, We're going to introduce you to the wonderful world of Google Earth and especially how it can do really amazing things for your family history research. I know you've heard me talk about it here on the show. This will be a chance if you haven't already checked it out to see it on the webinar and uh, see what the possibilities are. It's pretty amazing. So if you are ready to rock your ancestors world, you will definitely want to attend the free webinar on May 24th of 2011. And again, that's 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. And of course, there's a big benefit to attending the live presentation because you not only get to ask questions, but we're going to give away some great stuff, prizes, (laughs) and you have to be present to win. So we hope to see you there. And speaking of webinars, You can just imagine how expensive it can get to hire a genealogy speaker, fly them out to your location, put them up in a hotel, do all that stuff. It adds up really fast. And what that has meant to a lot of societies is that they really can't afford to get speakers that are outside of their local area. Well, what's happening is online webinars is really changing that. It is broadening the options that are available to you in your local genealogy society. In fact, the Story County, Iowa Genealogical Society was faced with just that situation. And we put our heads together and I'm going to be presenting, getting the scoop on your ancestors from old newspapers live for their society on August 27th of 2011. This is going to be so cool because I'll have my webcam so they can see me talking to them. They can see my slides. They're going to have a moderator who can pass along the questions from the audience and I'm going to be able to answer them live right there. Very interactive. It really is the next best thing to being there and we're all very excited about it. So if you'd like to learn more about the webinar or you happen to be in the Story County, Iowa area, we would love to have you attend the event, which is being co-sponsored by the Ames Public Library and Roots Magic. Just head over to sites.google.com slash site slash story genealogy and you can click the upcoming programs link. And if you'd like to talk to me about the possibility of perhaps doing a webinar for your group, email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or you can head on over to genealogygems.com and click the seminars button in the menu. The best news is that for a limited time, Roots Magic has agreed to sponsor my webinars, which means they're going to provide the go-to webinar platform for free. If your, your society has ever checked out the price of go to webinar. It's not cheap. Uh, they tend to want, you know, a monthly subscription or a yearly package. It's expensive. And the wonderful sponsor of this podcast, Roots Magic, they have an account. They are sponsoring me to do these webinars. And that means we can pass the savings on to you. It doesn't cost anything for the platform in terms of delivering the online webinar. And you don't have to worry about having a subscription to that at your society. You just book me as your speaker. We put it all together. And it's really quite the same as hiring somebody in your local area, except for you, you're getting somebody who you may not otherwise be able to bring out long distance and do all that travel cost. So there's a huge savings for your group. If you'd like to know more about that, we'd love to talk with you about it. Okay, next here in the mailbox, as I mentioned at the top of the show in a recent Genealogy Gems e-newsletter, I shared an email that I received from Eric, who shared the genealogical serendipity that runs through his family when it comes to dates. And it was uncanny how many of his ancestors shared common significant dates, like birthdays and death dates and so on. I mean, it was all over the place. 
Well, many of you chimed in that these odd occurrences were certainly not exclusive to Eric's tree. And many of you have noticed the same thing in your own family. I want to read to you a couple of uh, comments that were posted on Facebook on this article. Um, Debbie wrote, My daughter's birthday is my great-grandparents' wedding date, about 70, give or take, years apart. And Vicki wrote, My son and I share the same date, December 19th. I was born at 9 in the morning, and he was born at 9 at night. <laughs> and Susan wrote, My father-in-law and his only sister were born on the same day, four years apart. You can imagine the comments we've made over the years. <laughs> and Gus actually has a similar situation. He wrote, My sister and I were born the same day, eight years apart. We never forget each other's special day. And Patty emailed me about some genealogical serendipity that seemed associated with a particular place in her family. She writes, I have a story for you about genealogy serendipity. I have always been drawn to the Seattle, Washington area. I could not understand why I loved that town so much. The first time I went there as a teenager on a family vacation when I was 17 years old, I felt like it was a special place, and then when I was around 30 years old, I went there on a trip with my husband, and I was the bus driver for a church group. About five years ago, I went to the Gig Harbor area, about one hour away from Seattle, and I worked at a camp for the summer. I was in heaven, didn't know anybody there, but I was very happy there. I got an email out of the blue about two months ago from a cousin I didn't know, and she sent me a newspaper clipping from 1934 of my great-great-grandfather, Alman Ford. It showed him and one of his grandsons, and Alman was a fiddle player in Seattle, Washington, and some of my other family members lived and died there and were buried there. Now I know why I love it so. Well, Patty, I share your love of the Pacific Northwest. Um, I lived up there for many, many years, and I actually do know that little town of Gig Harbor very, very well. My husband, Bill, his sister lived there for many, many years on the water, and we spent many happy summer days on the beach there with the kids. So thanks for sharing, and hmm, it certainly is a small world, isn't it? Next up, I've got a question here from Juliana, who writes, First off, thank you for your wonderful podcast. Thank you, Juliana. I am just starting my journey into family history research, and you've given me many great tips and tricks for getting started. I'm currently working my way through your family history, genealogy made easy podcast from the beginning, and I have a question. When I find a source, say a census record, I know that I need to cite the source and then add the information I learned in my database. But where do I cite it? Do I list the census as a source for the individual or for each piece of information I got? For example, if I learned their immigration date or birth date and maybe could extrapolate a marriage date from the information, would I list the census three times for that individual and link it to each piece of information I got? Or do I just list it as a new event, census 1930, for example, and let it be that? I'd like to do it right from the start. Ah, it's a good plan. She says, I'm using PATH as my database if that matters. Also, my husband's family has been quite easy to research. Mine, not so much. I'm a first-generation American. My parents and siblings and I immigrated when I was a child. Do you have any tips or tricks for researching in South America, Brazil specifically? That is where all my ancestors are from. It's been difficult to find anything much online. Thanks again for your great podcast. Well, Juliana... Um, I use Roots Magic rather than PATH, and I'm not familiar with PATH or how sources are done in PATH. Personal Ancestral File, which was, of course, first introduced back in 1997, it's known as PATH, it's being phased out. Family Search is moving to an internet based family tree system. It's called New Family Search. My understanding is, is that you're going to be able to use PATH on your computer and you can export your data to the new family search family tree system if you'd like to. What I would suggest is looking at a full service database program. Of course, I love Roots Magic, they're a sponsor of this show, but there are many good ones out there because I really think that you would be happier in the long run with a, a good solid genealogy database that sits on your computer and then you can you know use a service like that we were talking about ancestor sync where you could then move the information up to an online service like new family search but i think that you'll be happier like i say in the long run with the capabilities of what that complete database program would do for you and i can tell you that most of the major software programs 
once you enter your source citation once, then you just link it to each piece of data that it's the source for in your database. Genealogy software programs will provide usually a template for proper source citation because you don't want to just put in census 1930. Uh, it's not enough information, but rather you want to, to use source citations that include the page number, the uh, enumeration district, the location, all that great information. Once the source is entered, it should be fairly easy to attach it to each piece of data that it supports. In fact, um, in my database, everything is linked to the source from which it came, each piece of data. It just saves a lot of headache later on. <laughs> when you go looking at something, you go, oh, that doesn't look right. Or where did I get that? And you don't have to go, you know, trying to recreate history. You've got it there and it's um, recorded in your database. And I've got some good news for you. Family Search has been adding records from Brazil lately. So I'm going to put a link in the show notes to their latest notice about records that include Brazilian records at familysearch.org slash node, N-O-D-E slash 1178. But I'll have that in the show notes for you. They have been adding them fairly regularly, and it looks like they're continuing to. So that's good news. Just do a search at Family Search for the location and then the type of record that you're looking for. And if they don't have it, you may see it become available in the future because they are working on them. You may also want to do some reading in the Family Search Wiki on Brazil research. There's um, quite a few good articles there. I did a quick little look. Um, just head over to wiki.familysearch.org. So thank you so much for writing. And uh, actually, I heard I sent this information to her in an email, and she got right back to me and said, "Oh, Roots Magic looks wonderful." <laughs> she was so excited. So Juliana is on her way with a uh, full-blown database there on her computer. And I'm sure she'll be exploring new family search as well. So good luck. And let's see here. Oh, next, Elizabeth has a question about researching a divorce. Okay, she writes, I have recently returned to genealogy research after being out of the game for many years. I'm truly enjoying picking up this hobby again, especially with all the new resources available, including your wonderful podcast. Thank you, Elizabeth. She says, I have a question about turn of the century divorces. I have a shoestring budget for genealogy, so my strategy is to look at the free sources first. I generally start with FamilySearch and Ancestry.com Library Edition. I found a handful of couples that around the turn of the century that had been separated or divorced, but one or both of the people told the census taker that they were widowed. Until I realized this was happening, I simply took the widowed at face value and I moved on. Ah, that's a good uh, example of having that source cited so that you know where you got it from and realize that you just want that extra verification when you find data like that. She says, I'm going to share one example. On the 1900 census for Dallas County in the house of my second great-grandparents lived their younger child and a son, Dawn, age 26, and widowed. Well, I knew that there was a child, Homer, from that first marriage, but he was not in the house. I figured that the child must have gone to live with his maternal grandparents. Well, I started looking for the maternal grandparents, and I found them in another part of Dallas County with the child and his mother. She listed herself as divorced. I am curious if you have found this in your research, and also if there are resources that you might suggest for finding divorce information around the turn of the century. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, Elizabeth, I have two what I think are excellent free resources for you that I think will move your research forward. First up, I've seen situations regarding divorces in the family tree being reported much the same way that you have seen in yours. And I'm sure that there's, you know, a variety of reasons why that happens. But most obviously, there is likely embarrassment that might have been experienced at that time about the divorce. So, to learn more about this, because I was kind of curious when you brought up this question, uh, I tapped into one of my favorite resources that I talk about in the genealogist Google toolbox, and that is Google Books. So using some of the search techniques that I describe in the book, I came up with a really interesting free book that's fully digitized, and you can read it online. It's called Marriage and Divorce, 1867 to 1906, Volume 1 by the Department of Commerce and Labor Bureau of the Census, and it was published in 1909. 
This is an incredibly comprehensive book covering marriage and divorce statistics, not only for the U.S., but around the world. And it really talks about the evolution of how they came to gathering this data and uh, the situations they found themselves in in trying to do so. You know, as you read the first few chapters, it becomes clear that collection of divorce information was a fairly new phenomenon at that point in time. So as the U.S. federal census enumerators, you know, kind of took over the the job of collecting the information from local jurisdictions, it was likely quite a shock to the system of the average person. I mean, you can just picture our ancestors faced with someone at their door asking them the most personal and embarrassing of questions. And it isn't difficult to imagine that less than truthful answers were being given. Uh, In fact, in 1905, Theodore Roosevelt wrote to the Congress, and he was pleading for the federal government to get behind the collection of divorce data. In the book here, it says, quote, The institution of marriage is, of course, at the very foundation of our social organization, and all influences that affect that institution are of vital concern to the people of the whole country. There's a widespread conviction that the divorce laws are dangerously lax and indifferently administered in some of the states, resulting in a diminishing regard for the sanctity of the marriage relation. The hope is entertained that cooperation amongst the several states that can be secured to that end, that there may be enacted upon the subject of marriage and divorce uniform laws containing all possible safeguards for the security of the family. Intelligent and prudent action in that direction will be greatly promoted by securing reliable and trustworthy statistics upon marriage and divorce. And that was Theodore Roosevelt. Then I'm going further through the book and using the search feature, and I find on page 50, perhaps an answer to your question. comes right out, and the book says, It should be remembered, however, that in the United States, the number of divorced persons reported by the general census of population is grossly deficient, because many persons who are divorced, being sensitive in regard to that fact, report themselves as single or widowed. (laughs) Pretty interesting stuff. The book is really interesting. I will have a link so that you can go directly to Google Books and access it. I encourage all of you to take a look at it. Certainly, um, the information about marriage and divorce at that time and and how it was dealt with in terms of um, data collection is, is very interesting and very applicable to our research. And my second recommendation about divorce research and getting information by location is, again, check out the FamilySearch Wiki. It's at wiki.familysearch.org. The wiki really is a treasure trove of useful articles. They are written by family history consultants, people who work at the Family History Library, and other uh, known genealogists. And I think that you'll find uh, even particularly as you start to try to investigate divorce information in a particular state, I think you'll find some great articles there. So great question, Elizabeth. And I really enjoyed spending some time kind of reading through the, the marriage and divorces of 1867 and 1906 in Google Books and learning more about the subject. I mean, we can never stop learning about how these records get created because it really helps us understand and put each document in context, doesn't it? really helps us understand and also to really understand that not every single answer was necessarily truthful. I will have again links for the book and the search wiki in the show notes. All right, I have got a really fun gem for you and you're just going to have to hang in there and wait. It's coming up next. Are you looking to take the next step in your family history research and start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database? Or are you looking to make a switch to a more user-friendly genealogy software program? When my listeners and students ask me which program I prefer, I always recommend Roots Magic. It's the program I decided to make the switch to a couple of years ago, and I am so glad I did. You just won't find a more powerful genealogy software program, and building your family tree is easier than ever with the new Roots Magic 4. With Roots Magic, you can add unlimited facts, find anyone in your database with lightning speed with Roots Magic Explorer, quickly and easily create perfectly formatted sources with the Roots Magic Source Wizard. It makes it so easy. 
You can create customized reports. And best of all, you can now take Roots Magic wherever your research takes you with Roots Magic to go, which lets you run Roots Magic directly off your flash drive. And Roots Magic makes it a snap to share your family history. You know how important I think that is. It'll help you publish a book, create stunning wall charts, shareable CDs, even create websites automatically from your data. Really, what are you waiting for? Download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 4 and see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. Well, I have not exhausted my collection of recordings that I made during my trip to the Who Do You Think You Are live event in London, England earlier this year. I have a new one for you. And I was upstairs at the this huge exhibit hall and wandering around. And there is my friend, the photo detective, Maureen Taylor. And she told me that she was there working together with another UK genealogist on a project bringing together photographs and history in a very unique way. She was also doing consultations and people had brought their old photographs with them so that they could sit down together and do quick little analysis of who was in the picture and when the picture was taken and the, and the history and the context. All that really interesting stuff that she does. And so here is my conversation with Maureen Taylor, the photo detective at Who Do You Think You Are Live in London? And some of her, how should I call this? Ladies in waiting, or at least ladies holding photographs, staying in line waiting to talk to the photo detective. Well, even here in London, I come across old friends, and I've just found Maureen Taylor at the Photos Through the Ages booth upstairs in it's kind of a military photographic gallery area. Hi, Maureen. Hey, Lisa. How are you doing? doing great. Seems like we've been just crossing paths everywhere we go, which is awesome. And introduce me to your friend here, who I know is you've been working very closely with. Right. This is James Morley, and James Morley has a website called whatsthatpicture.com, and I interviewed him two years ago for a little YouTube video that I did on this conference. And so we've kept in touch for the last couple of years, and a month or so ago, he sent me an email, and he said, have you looked at the new part of my website, which is an interactive timeline on Flickr? And so we're now working together on this, and it's What's That Picture, Photos Through the Ages. Go to What's That Picture and then click on Interactive Timeline, but this is James Morley. He can tell you more about it. It's absolutely brilliant. So, James, what's these pictures? <laughs> what are we looking at here up on the booth? Well, on the wall here, we've just got a selection of what Maureen and I have put together of images that represent the different decades through photography and the different fashions and so on. So we're starting in the 1850s and moving right through to about the 1920s. Um, we've picked individual images, but the interactive timeline online, the aim is to get hundreds, even thousands of images across the whole period and present them so that people can scan through and look at ones that represent the different times. Now, what are the source of all these images that you're getting? Did you start with your own collection and just spread out from there? I, I personally am a collector and I've got an attic full of, of different photographs and um, I, m my particular interest is trying to date them and find out more about the subjects and everything in them. But the the nice thing about the interactive timeline is we're inviting everybody to submit their own pictures. So we can get pictures from around the world, from different uh, families, different decades, all in one, presented in one place. How in the world did you keep Maureen Taylor out of your attic? I'm surprised she's here when she knows there's an attic full of photographs Actually, somewhere. I buy photos from him every year. <laughs> <laughs> I just went through okay, the now I know. It all comes yeah, together. It all comes together. And I've supplied some content for the website. Yeah. We're working on a timeline of what women's fashions look like and then we're going to do men's fashions, although there's subtle differences in men's fashions between the UK and America, so it's a little more difficult and we have some other plans as well. There are so many elements to old photographs that you could hone in on like that. You've done the hairstyles book, you can do the fashions, you can do even just the settings that you see in the backgrounds of these photographs. They all tell a story, right? They all tell a story. And Lisa, you know, my favorite photograph on this entire timeline is the dog standing between two oh, chairs. My word. 
So everyone He's not standing between them. He's almost standing on the tops of the backs of them. He's standing on the backs of them, and we don't know anything about it. We know it's the 1860s, we think, but we don't know anything about him. But he's obviously some sort of famous trick dog, so people yeah. have to go to whatsthatpicture.com know, and look at him. We do know his name is Clyde, because that was written on the back. <laughs> so if you have a Clyde in your pedigree, shall we yes, say, oh, ow, dum dum. Okay, so photos through the ages, James. You said this is with Flickr. Uh, is this a connection of the Flickr site with your website? How does that work? Uh, we're, we're simply using Flickr as a great tool for other people to share their photographs because I've used Flickr both as this, which is my hobby, and also my, my day job. Um, as, as a website manager, I've used Flickr to deliver different sort of public engagement things. And um, it is just a great tool for people to be able to use. So I know that, uh, now with Flickr, you need like a, a free password sign-in type of thing, correct? Yeah, that's right. I think with the free account, you can upload up to 200 images, which, you know, you're lucky if you've got more than 200 images of your own family. But yeah, you can share it on that. And you can always upgrade. It's only a small fee. And then how about in terms of interacting with what's that picture.com? Well, the nice thing, again, with Flickr is that they've got a very uh, easy way of being able to use their images and display their images on other websites. So I've been able to, because again, my background in, in web development is code something that presents them all on the What's That Picture site as this interactive timeline using a, another free tool to, you can literally just drag the timeline along from one end to the other and just view all the images pop up as, as you progress through the ages. That's wonderful. And so Maureen, you're here at the booth. Um, have you been doing consultations as you often do? Yes, Lisa. <laughs> oh, I just see a look that says I've not done just one or two. Lisa, um, we had a line all the way around our five meter long booth uh, starting at 9, it opened at 10 o'clock yesterday morning. We had a line at 10.15 that didn't end until like 5, 5.30. Yeah. And today we've had the same thing. It opened at 9.30. We've had a line around the booth and it's really fantastic. People just line up and they bring their photos and we look at them and you see all kinds of amazing things. Exactly. Now, yeah. tell the audience how they can get um, subscribed to your newsletter so that they can keep track of the events you're coming to and then maybe prepare to bring a photograph to an event like this. Sure, absolutely. You can go to my website, which is MaureenTaylor.com, and you can sign up for my newsletter there. Um, James, do you have a sign-up box on what's that picture .com? I do, yeah, on the home page. So okay. they can just put their email address in there. I tend to post uh, little snippets of interesting photos that have caught my eye um, quite regularly. So, yeah, any little things that um, mysteries, identifications, those sorts of things. So, Yeah, we've been partnering doing photo IDs uh, the last three. Who do you think you are? So we should have a great time. Fantastic. Well, wonderful to see you both. I'm going to go snoop, and i got to get a good close picture of Clyde. I'll try to include him on the website with your, your whole board here. Um, definitely go visit whatsthatpicture.com. And, boy, was I lucky to catch you during lunch. Now go back and eat. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> What's your name? Julia. Julia. And how did you hear about photos through the ages? Um, I just spotted it when I walked around, but I had uh, been to the show a couple of years ago and I had seen their stand then. Okay, now I see you have a bag. Did you bring a photograph with you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you have a, a great little... Oh, look at this. Okay, so tell me, do you know who the people are in the picture? Um, I think it's some relative of mine, one of them, and the other one apparently is King Umberto of Italy. Oh my word. Now, this looks like a glossy reproduction. Do you, yeah, does that really give you a sense sure. of the time frame? Not really. It's um, My cousin sent it to me, so I'm not too sure when it came from, but I would imagine the 1920s, the original. I don't know. So what are you hoping <laughs> that uh, James and Maureen are going to be able to tell you? Well, a little bit more about it and whether this really is King Umberto. Oh, exactly. Exactly. And then I, I'm trying to look. He looks like he's wearing his dressing gown. Yeah, it looks like he's wearing a, a robe. Yes, a dressing gown. <laughs> yes, we're not too sure, but he's got boots on with it. So. And what's the signature here down at the bottom? That, that's where it says, we think, Umberto. Okay. And there's something else there, but of course it's obscured by his boot. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, well, good luck. I hope he, uh, they're able to give you some good ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Uh, Diane Nutman. Hi. Diane, and you are? 
I'm Dying Sister, Dying Sister Jill. Sisters. Jill. Fantastic. Now, have you been to this conference before? No. This no? is our first time. I'm a first-timer, too, yeah. so that's wonderful. <laughs> okay. And now, you must have heard then about the fact that they were going to do the photos at, through the ages here at the show because you brought some with you. Well, if I just show you the first photo, this yes. is what set us off on our, our trip um, with finding our family tree. Well, that looks quite this old. This is our great-great-grandfather. And that's how we started to look into it, because we found this photo, and we thought, we've got to find out who he is. We found and it in a box yes. of our grandmother's, our grandmother yeah. after she died. Yeah. And actually, we've managed to get back into the 1700s with that side of our family, which is brilliant. Yes. But the photo that we want, to, that we brought today to show them, is this one, which is the other side of our family, our grandfather's sister. Um, and she was a nurse in Ireland. We think this is her, but we don't know what date it is, so that's why we, we want to queue up here to find out what so date. So here you're going to have... no idea who she is, really. Yeah. We, we, we think we know guessing. who she is, but we're guessing at the moment. So by it. identifying and dating this photograph, you're going to yes. be able to line this up with yes. census records and, and see. Yes. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's definitely somebody that was a nurse, but we're not sure whether it's her or not. Yeah. But we'd like, so we want to get a date, really, for the photo. And she has a couple of clues. I mean, she has jewellery, exactly. and you have and a hairstyle, clothing. and the clothing, yes. and then even just the setting here, yeah. things to work with. And, of course, it looks like it's obviously been through challenging it does. times. Yes, very much um, so. Have you looked into some of the, the photo restorers I around know. here? Actually, we, we have made copies of it and ourselves, and it actually comes up, obviously, a lot better when you, when you do uh, copy it. Um, so that's why it's in here, because it's sort of been, it's obviously been battered about a bit, been around the houses, various people's houses, I should think. <laughs> oh, you bet. Now, you have a couple of other different photographs oh, yes, here, too. Oh, yes, these sort of varying things that we, I just put together in here because we actually met up with a cousin of ours yesterday, so I took them to show her, so it all sort of related together, really, and to what we were doing this weekend. But they're all different people, so it would be quite confusing to sort of go into all the detail about all of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we're meeting up with all our family, though, in August, so we're hoping to get a family tree sorted out yes. by that time. Oh, fabulous. Yes, and then put some of these people on that yeah. we weren't sure about. So how long have you actually been doing your family history? You said it kind of started with the photo of the great-great-grandfather. Probably only about a year, yeah. really. When I retired. Yeah. <laughs> when I had time for my job <laughs> to actually do something, and then we started, and then yeah. we went on a Who Do You Think You Are trip we last did. year. We called it that. Yes, so just we went, the two of us. Yes. And we went to meet. We had a wonderful time because we, we were following our father's family, and they were all shopkeepers. So we went to a place called West Mersey oh, um, in, Essex. in Essex, and uh, we actually found people who invited us into their houses, who had photographs on their walls of our great grandfather's shop and our great grandfather's shop. And it was wonderful. We found out all sorts of things. And, and did you find it? The building. He'd actually yeah. built the shop, so he had his own initials in one of the bricks with the date. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find it as emotional as some of the celebrities do on the show? It I, was emotional. It was quite it? emotional. It's yes. more exciting, really, I think, than emotional. You know, actually finding out, uh, actually seeing places. I think is the thing: is to go to the places to see them. But when you that's can, when you really feel like you're being becoming a detective, don't you? Yeah. yeah. It's got a lot of meaning, really, when you look back like that. Then you do wish that you'd actually spoken to your parents more because our parents have died yes. now. Yeah. But we, we found out more and we'd love to ask them questions but of course it's too late. Well, that is the large question, isn't it? How in the world do we inspire our own children to start asking earlier? I mean, when our children are sort of between the ages of 20 and 30 and really they say, oh yeah, yeah, type thing, you know, and you think, well, you wait. When you yes. get a bit older, you're going to want to know all this. But we'll have a record anyway, so that'll be good. Yeah, you'll That's have done the right thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> good ladies, good luck with your pictures. Thank you Those very are much. wonderful. Thank All you. right, Thank thanks you. a lot. Okay, and so tell me your name. My name is Fern. Fern, and your husband mentioned that you have quite a varied and uh, far reaching family tree. Tell me a little bit about yours. My tree goes all the way back to William the Conqueror, who happens to be my 26th great grandfather. Oh my goodness. And, and, and you've traced that in a direct line yes. and determined that's amazing. Um, how long have you been doing your family history research? I started with my father's family back in about 1987. That was before everything was done on computers, so it was a lot of legwork. Um, we got back to about 1630 by um, um, 1989 when my father died. Then I put it down and left it for a while. Since um, computerization has come along, then I I've done a lot more research. We knew nothing about my mother because she was made what you call a ward of court. She was born in 1916, didn't know her family at all. 
Um, and a year and a week ago, on Ancestry, I managed to uncover my mother's family, and I have now got two aunts, two uncles, and a whole raft of family. My mum, very sadly, has been dead for 11 years, so she doesn't know that she had five siblings, but I do know about them. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? You can go from feeling you have a very small little circle right. to all of a sudden you belong to a greater number of people. Yes, and instead of being names now, I've got photographs of my grandparents and my great-grandparents. So some of these relatives that you've gotten in contact with then maybe had some photographs? Yes, yes, they've managed to supply me with photographs, lots of family information, and I'm now a much bigger family than I ever thought I'd got. So you were doing the research by hand, as we all were, back yes. before the Internet, and then the Internet took off and you kind of rejoined the game. Do you find your... Are you more passionate now than even before? Yes. Very addicted. <laughs> terribly addicted. I spend hours. Yeah. My husband peels me away at midnight and says, do you realize what the time is? Yes, exactly. Now, I imagine if you find you have royal ancestry, that's a great a gift because they were ones who truly have been tracing genealogy for many centuries. That's right. So though I've taken it back to uh, William the Conqueror, I've stopped for the time being because I'm having a Who Do You Think You Are party next month for my 60th birthday. And so I've had to stop for the time being, but I do know with my royal lineage that I can go back at least another 400 years. Oh, now that I have to hear about this. The party. This is a birthday party that it's you're putting together? party. Okay. And so tell me, how did you, what's, what's this Who Do You Think You Are party going to entail? It's going to be a fancy dress party. Uh, so it's Who Do You Think You Are? So for the older relatives that might not want to dress up, they can be my aunts and uncles, who they are. Or you can be somebody from history that you'd like to be. Oh, wonderful. So I'm actually going to be an Elizabethan lady with a beautiful big dress um, and a lovely headdress that I've made. Oh my gosh, how amazing. So I assume you had to do quite a bit of research, yes. even just come up with the costume, which again That's right. teaches you more about that history. Yes, it's an authentic pattern. So it's um, cartridge pleats, so seven meters of fabric in the outer skirt. It's a boned bodice, and I've done all of that work. Oh, so we have to ask, what are you serving to eat? Uh, well, actually, it's going to be a buffet because it's difficult with 80 people. It would have been nice to have had a pig roast, but where we are, we can't manage to do that. That would have been the ideal. Yes, yes. Wonderful. And how about this? Uh, are you going to have a, a computer out where people can sit down during the party and even dabble in there a little bit? No, the whole family tree is going to be printed Wonderful. in five sections because it's so large. It can't be printed as one thing. It's too big. And how will you be recording this for posterity and for future descendants to see this party? Uh, well, I haven't thought about that one yet, yes. really. I do have two professional photographers that are my friends, so no doubt they will make photographic information to, to be recorded for me. I can imagine it will stir up a lot of interesting conversation, won't it? I think so. Well, wonderful. So I have to, now I'm guessing you don't have a king on some of your photographs here. Uh, who are you hoping, and what photograph are you hoping that Maureen's going to help you with? It's relatives from my, my newfound mother's family, um, and they were tailors um, in Bedfordshire. And I just need to, they got the most amazing outfits. Oh, my But word. there were 12 children. And I just want to try and get this one dated because then the most amazing dresses. But it's because he was a tailor, so he would have been very skilled at making beautiful outfits for his children. And they absolutely would be wearing their best. Don't you love the, the lady sitting in the center with her yes. arm reaching down and looking lovingly at their child? That's one of the daughters that got married later. And that and the combination of pictures together, I would think, will help you then get a more accurate yes. dating. Hopefully. Yes. Wonderful. Well, good luck, Fern. This looks like wonderful, and have a wonderful time at your party. I think, oh, I think lots of people around the world listening to this conversation are going to be going, hmm, there's a birthday party to look forward to putting together. Right. What a wonderful idea. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 110.
You know, at the top of the show, we talked about some of the online webinar events that I'm doing, but it's even more fun to attend a presentation in person. And I'm going to be hitting the road again here very soon. And I hope to see many of you at some of the great genealogy conferences coming up. Uh, First up, I will be at the Southern California Genealogy Society Jamboree, June 9th through the 11th of 2011. We're going to be doing the live podcast there. And this is really cool. If you're going, you need to download that free Jamboree app. Um, If you have a smartphone, if you have an iPhone, this is really cool stuff. They have put together all the information, maps of the exhibit hall, the class schedule, who the speakers are, and I have been uploading documents and goodies for the Genealogy Gems podcast under the exhibit information, exhibitor information. So that's all there. Check it out. If you have, like I say, a smartphone, you know, an Android phone or an iPhone, um, you'll want the Jamboree app. It's going to be the coolest, newest thing. (laughs) Then I'm going to be in Loveland, Colorado. It's just outside of Denver for the Loveland Family History Expo, June 24th and 25th, 2011. And I'm really excited to say that they have asked me to be their keynote speaker at that event. So I am looking forward to that. And of course, I'll be teaching. And then in July, I will be keynoting and teaching at the Midwest Family History Expo in Overland Park, Kansas first time out there, really looking forward to it. I hope that many of you out there in the Midwest are going to make it to the expo. I've been looking forward to meeting so many of you and this will be my first chance to get out there. July 29th and 30th, 2011. Be there or be square. It's going to be fun. (laughs) And uh, for more information on those conferences, just head on over to fhexpos.com. All right. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. 